So today is the day we can finally lift the lid on the new Ryzen 7000 series of processors, starting with our coverage and mass amounts of benchmarks for the Ryzen 9 7900X, the shiny new 12 core 24 thread beast that is the direct replacement for the 5900X. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Andy, what are you watching? It's, uh, it's, it's not what you think. Wow, it's so big. Why, thank you. It's the new AOC AG493 UCX, 49 inches of pure performance and a refresh rate of 120 hertz. It's so fast. You can even do two at a time. What? You can connect two devices at a time and split the screen. With FreeSync Premium Pro, a 32 to nine aspect ratio and a built-in KVM, you'll be finished in no time. Gaming, I mean. What, what did you think I mean? Get your mind out the gutter and click the link in the description to find out more. Now, before we get started, we will have content on all the other processors launching today. But for now, I want to focus on the Ryzen 9 7900X. Now, while the 7950X is the flagship, if the 7900X is anything like its predecessor, it should actually offer very similar performance, especially in gaming, and for a more reasonable price point. Now, I don't want to stomp too much over the specs and whatnot, because Lisa Sue already told us everything we needed to know, and the full product pages over on amd.com have actually been live for quite some time now, but we will gloss over some of the key points of the 7900X and the 7000 series in general on AM5. So the big one, I guess, comes down to this being a completely new platform. While we have a new range of processors, we also have a new range of motherboards, a new socket, chipset, and support for the fastest technologies on the market, like DDR5, and also support for the fastest technologies not on the market, like PCI Express 5.0, of which the likes of NVMe-based storage will be available in the future, and GPUs, maybe at some point. But for now, who knows? In terms of the CPUs, what I guess you need to know is that the whole lineup is now based on TSMC's five nanometer process node. And due to that, we see some pretty hefty gains to go with it. Firstly, the base frequency has been increased from 3.7 gigahertz on the 5900X to a whopping 4.7 gigahertz on the 7900X, along with a boost frequency increase from 4.8 gigahertz to 5.6 gigahertz. Not being content there, AMD have also managed to increase the IPC, or instructions per clock, by 13%, and have also seen the L2 cache on all processors doubled. So it all sounds pretty impressive, and the fact that the 7900X has kept the same $549 launch price that we saw on the 5900X, it's gonna be an interesting one to see exactly how it performs. Another interesting subject to talk about is the design that the processor now has, which has finally changed after many, many, many years. In fact, if I remember rightly, the IHS design was first implemented on the Athlon 64 claw hammer range of processors back in 2003, and it's just been the same ever since. Now, I'm not sure if it's just me, but though it looks a bit odd, I will admit, on the Zen 4 range, and it now kind of gives you the fear of getting thermal paste everywhere, it also has a kind of more extreme look to it. Hopefully the performance does too. Now, speaking of performance, let's jump into that. And with any new platform comes a new test bench, and when the AMD press pack was sent out, it came along with a motherboard and a set of memory. Now we're not actually using the memory here today as we had already used another kit for Alder Lake testing on Intel and wanting to keep things as fair and consistent as possible, we wanted to use the same kit for AM5 testing. Motherboard wise, we're using the Gigabyte Aorus X670E Master with the BIOS version 813B. For the memory, we're using the same Corsair Dominator Platinum DDR5 32 gig 5200 MHz kit that we use for our Alder Lake testing, again, to keep things as fair and consistent as possible. And then to keep the processors cool, we're using the NZXT Kraken Z73 RGB AIO coolers. And to alleviate any bottleneck, we're using a Seagate Fire Cuda 530 1TB NVMe drive. For all of our testing, we're using the Zotac GeForce RTX 3090 Trinity with the latest vBIOS with resizable bar enabled, something that we said we'd do when we moved to a new platform. We also have XMP enabled on all platforms, again, to make things as fair as possible. Now, our whole test system is inside the NZXT H7 Flow chassis to represent true world performance. And as a side note, power figures are measured using HW Monitor on the CPU package. But we will be moving to a hardware-based solution in the form of the Elmore Labs PMD USB in the very near future. For our game data, we're recording everything using the latest version 1.6.9 of CatFrame X. And for our AM4 and older comparisons, Obviously, we can only do so much in terms of keeping things fair, 
but as they use DDR4 versus AM5, which uses DDR5, there's only so much we can do before kind of factors fall outside of our control. Also, if you want to see all of our chart data, you can over on Patreon, where you'll get access to them and a ton of other benefits. The link is down below. So with all that out of the way, let's get into it. So starting with SuperPi, and here we see that the 7900X has managed to shave off just under two minutes compared to the 5900X. The 7900X does, however, manage to pull ahead of the 12900K from Intel, while the higher core 5950X still manages to hold the top spot, albeit only by a few seconds. In W Prime, we see the 7900X storming ahead in the 32M calculation test with a clear lead over the 5950X and 12900K, but as such a small calculation time doesn't really give much to go off. The 1024M test, however, paints a better picture, with the 7900X coming in as a clear winner at almost 9 seconds faster than the 5950X, and considerably faster than the 12900K, though as we know, then pesky equals do skew this test somewhat. Moving over to compression and looking at the 7-zip benchmark where again, we see the 7900X pushing to the top of our chart, followed closely behind by the 5950X and seeing the 12900K and 5900X both coming in with the same result. In terms of decompression, things change up slightly with some bigger variances. Firstly, we see the 5950X pushing ahead of the 7900X, though not by much, and other older AMD CPUs ahead of the Alder Lake based 12900K. Memory is an interesting one due to the DDR5 versus DDR4 argument with our testing, but we do see some performance increases with the DDR5 based 7900X when compared to the previous generation, though still not enough to keep up with the 12900K, which you could argue has had longer to adapt to DDR5 and utilize its performance. Latency suffers slightly compared to DDR4, but is expected, and as the platform matures, we could see this falling slightly in the future. As we look at our rendering benchmarks, we start with Blender, where the 7900X has a clear 18% lead over the 5950X, and a slightly smaller 16% lead over the current Intel flagship. In terms of progression from the 5900X, that's where we see a whopping 43% performance uplift generation to generation. Cinebench is great to look at for both single core and multi core performance, where we see the 7900X coming in with a 25% boost in performance over the 5900X, a slightly smaller 22% lead over the 5950X, and a 0.1% lead over the Intel 12900K. This could be argued as margin of error, but with Intel's 13th gen processors coming out soon, single core performance could spell out problems for AMD based on this one test. As we move to multi-core performance, we see some stronger gains with a 39% lead over the 5900X and a 16% lead over the higher core count 5950X, whilst the closest lead of all is with the 12900K, which still sees the 7900X ahead by 5.8%. In Corona, we see the 7900X just nipping ahead of the 5950X in render time by one second, which further cements a lead over the 12900K as well. While render time is one metric, the other comes in the form of rays per second, where the 7900X improves on performance by over 26% when compared to the 5900X, over 15% compared to the 12900K, and manages to take the top spot ahead of the 5950X, albeit by 1%. In Keyshot Viewer, where we see performance based on multiples of render time on their reference system, and we actually see some pretty hefty gains again, with the 7900X pushing over 34% more performance compared to the 5900X, 14% compared to the 12900K, and a pretty nice push of 9% over the 5950X. In V-Ray and the last of our render-based tests, we again see a decent uplift from the 5900X to the 7900X by 42%. Compared to the Intel flagship, the lead is smaller, but at 22%, it's still a sizable lead. And we also see a 15.3% increase in performance over the higher core count 5950X. Moving over to synthetic benchmarks and in 3D Mark Firestroke, while we do see an improvement of around 6% generation to generation, it's only barely enough to push ahead of the 12900K by around 1.2%, and still sees the 5950X ahead of them all. The physics score did come out dramatically better on the 7900X than the other processors tested, but not enough to make a noticeable difference in the overall score. In 3D Mark Timespire, we see a slightly smaller generational improvement of around 3%, which drops slightly lower when looking at the performance uplift over the 5950X. When compared to Intel's 12900K, the 7900X does fall a little short by around 5%, and in the CPU score, there's a dramatic difference with the 12900K leading by 31%. 
In Geekbench, looking at the single core performance, the 7900X holds a strong 11% lead over the 12900K and a 27 to 28% lead over both the 5900X and 5950X processors. In multi-core performance, the lead diminishes with only a 3% lead over the 12900K, though the 7900X does manage to push ahead by over 15% compared to the 5950X Zen 3 flagship. In PCMark 10 Express, we see a similar trend with an 11% performance lead over the 5900X and a 16% lead over the 5950X. When it comes to the competition from Intel, the 7900X still has a comfortable lead of 8.5%, so I guess it's safe to say that speed wins in this test. Looking at web browser performance, starting with Google Octane, and in this test, Intel comes out on top, though only by just over 1%. Where we see some bigger gains is with a 24% lead over the 5900X and slightly smaller 21% lead over the 5950X. In Mozilla Kraken, the 7900X gives us the quickest result at 366 milliseconds, which is around 20% faster than what we saw from the 5900X. The 12900K did put up some good competition, and with the 13th generation of processors upon us pretty soon, it will be interesting to see what happens when we come to test them. In Web Expert, we see again the 7900X coming out on top with a small 3.9% lead over the Intel flagship. Generation to generation, we see a larger lead of 18% over the 5900X and a 47% lead over the Ryzen 9 3900X. So for those skipping a generation, this definitely gives you food for thought. Moving over to gaming, and in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, we see that having a newer or beefier CPU doesn't really make much of a difference in the average FPS. We do see a 5% increase in performance over the 5900X, but at well over 100 FPS, it's unlikely to be noticed anyway. What is likely to be noticed, however, is in the 1% lows, where we see a comfortable 15% uplift, giving us an overall more fluid gameplay that sits ahead of its predecessors and its main competitor. In Cyberpunk, we see a mammoth gain of over 40% when comparing the 7900X to the 5900X, though it does still fall ever so slightly behind the 12900K and the higher core count 5950X, though I'd expect the new 7950X to perform better than that. Now, when it comes to the 1% lows, again, we see a huge uplift, this time of 45% when comparing generation to generation, though again, it still falls behind the 5950X and the 12900K, though not by much. In F122, it's a very similar story with a 20% performance increase over the 5900X, 9% over the 5950X, and a 3% lead over the 12900K. While we are sitting well above 300 FPS and it's unlikely that you'll notice the difference at such a high frame rate, a win is still a win. The 1% lows were better generation to generation, but the lead did narrow to only 7% when comparing the 7900X to the 5900X, while the 5950X and 12900K gave very similar results to the 7900X, with Intel pushing just ahead. Without sounding like a broken record, we again see a healthy lead over the 5900X by just over 26% when looking at the average FPS, and a 14% lead over the 5950X. The results drew closer between the 7900X and the 12900K, with less than 1% between them, with the 7900X just coming out on top. It's a similar story with the 1% lows, where the 7900X takes a 36% lead over its predecessor. And while it does also manage to push in front of the 5950X again, it falls slightly short of the 12900K. Horizon Zero Dawn doesn't see as large of a difference between various processors, though we do still see a 9% lead when comparing the 7900X to the 5900X, which now sees it sitting just below the performance of the 5950X, and ever so slightly behind the 12900K. So a nice performance bump from last generation, but it does fall slightly short in the averages. Now in terms of the 1% lows, it does more than make up for it with a 19% lead over the 5900X and now sits even with the 5950X, which is just under 2 FPS higher than that of the 12900K. In Microsoft Flight Sim, we see a 21% increase in performance from the 5900X, which now sees the 7900X ahead of the 12900K by just under 6%, which is impressive, until we look at the 5800X 3D sitting another 20% ahead of that, which just shows us what a 7800X 3D could potentially be capable of in the future. The 1% lows are much closer with again a nice bump in performance from the 5900X to 7900X, though the 12900K and the 5000 series processors actually see some slightly better frame rates than the 7900X, albeit only by a few frames per second. In Red Dead Redemption 2, the gains are much smaller with the 7900X only sitting 6% ahead of the 5900X, though it does manage to push to the top of the stack in the averages. When it comes to the 1% lows, it falls just behind the 5800X 3D, though could be argued as margin of error, and will still offer a fluid gameplay experience nonetheless. 
Shadow of the Tomb Raider was a bit of an anomaly and actually gave us some quite odd results. While all of the processors performed around the same in the average FPS, the 7900X actually came in quite a bit lower, by over 20 FPS. Even with multiple retests we garnered the same result, so can only assume that Shadow of the Tomb Raider just isn't optimised for the likes of the 7900X, so an update could potentially fix that in the future. Lastly, in Watch Dog Legion, we again see a sizeable gain of 42% over the 5900X, which now puts the 7900X just behind both the 12900K from Intel and AMD's very own 5800X 3D, but does see it also push ahead of the 5950X. Now, when it comes to the 1% low, seeing the 5800X 3D as the only exception, we do see some pretty solid numbers, which would result in a more fluid gameplay experience overall. So some pretty interesting results and lots of information to digest, especially when looking at gaming performance on both generation to generation and how the new 7900X compares to the current Intel flagship. And the results are actually a bit of a mixed bag. Not only do we see a sizable 15% increase in performance compared to its predecessor, but we actually see the 12900K coming in with slightly better performance overall, though a lead of 1% doesn't really give something to shout about. When looking at the 1% lows overall, it's very similar in terms of the gains, and again, the 12900K just manages to push ahead. Having superior performance is one thing, but if the product costs more, then it doesn't offer much from a value for money perspective. Luckily, the 7900X comes in with a better cost per frame than both the 12900K and 5950X at $3.67 per frame. Though the 5900X and 5800X 3D both offer far superior value at under $3 per frame when looking at pure gaming performance. In the UK, the gap between the 12900K and 7900X is much smaller, with the 7900X still offering a better value for money proposition. Though that's where the value argument ends, as every other CPU we tested offered up better value for money when looking at the cost per frame. Taking a look at power consumption, and Intel have a clear winner when it comes to idle performance due to their split performance and efficiency cores. As we look at load under a typical Cyberpunk gaming run, the 7900X does manage to come in slightly more efficient compared to the 5900X, and sits much lower in power usage than both the 5950X and 12900K. And then under a Cinebench R23 load test, we see the power usage increase beyond both the 5900X and 5950X, though still ends up seeing the 12900K using around 45% more power in this test. With the average cost of 15.42 cents per kilowatt in the US, the 7900X comes in costing 0.005 cents at idle, which is the same as the 5900X and slightly cheaper than the 5950X. But with this one, we have to give it to Intel's 12900K with its efficiency cores really stealing the show. During gaming, the 7900X then steals the show compared to the 5900X, 5950X and 12900K, albeit by a small margin. And during our Cinebench load test, the 7900X falls down the stack, only being beaten by the 12900K, which would end up costing around 1.3 cents per kilowatt more to run. Sadly, electricity prices in the UK are somewhat more expensive at 34 pence per kilowatt due to the energy price guarantee. And with this, we still see the 7900X coming in cheaper than every CPU, apart from again, the 12900K due to its efficiency cores. During gaming, the 7900X is slightly more expensive to run than the 5800X 3D, but does come in cheaper than the 5900X, 5950X and Intel's 12900K, which is the most expensive CPU we tested today. Then in our Cinebench R23 run, we see the 7900X costing around 6 pence to run for an hour, compared to the 8.7 pence of the 12900K, while the 5950X and 5900X both come in significantly cheaper. Moving over to temperatures, at idle, the 7900X does end up being the hottest CPU we've tested at idle, at 42.3 degrees. While we'd expect a processor built onto the 5 nanometer process to run maybe a little bit cooler, it has actually allowed AMD to implement integrated graphics and to increase the performance quite dramatically too. During gaming, our NZXT Z73 RGB 360mm AIO was able to keep all of our processors at a reasonable level, with the 7900X running just under 2 degrees cooler than that of the 5950X, but it's now sitting just under 8 degrees hotter than the 5900X. And lastly, in Cinebench R23, the 7900X did get quite warm, but still sits just under 5 degrees below the quite toasty 12900K from Intel, but it's quite a bit warmer than both the 5950X and 5900X. So lots to go through, and there are a few things that I think need mentioning. The first comes down to me originally being, let's say, quite reserved about the 7000 series of processors as a whole, and more importantly, having a new platform. Purely because the last time that AMD had a new platform, it all went horribly wrong. 
AMD kind of, well, you know, mainly had problems when it comes to memory compatibility. And while we didn't use the G-Skill Expo enabled kit that AMD sent out to us, our Corsair DDR5 kit had no issues whatsoever. And for the first time in I don't know how long, we didn't have any BIOS updates. Now, typically with a new platform, we do find ourselves with mass amounts of BIOS updates, sometimes even one day before the launch. So I guess it's safe to say that, I don't know, AMD have learned a lot from the past and have meticulously worked on giving not only consumers, but us reviewers a better experience from the get-go. And I'm extremely thankful for that. Now, with a new platform, it also allowed us to implement some new changes that we wanted to do. And we'll also be looking at a wider scope of games in the near future to get kind of a better idea as to how the 7900X and the other chips in the range perform in a wider spectrum of titles. So the 7900X is coming in at $549 in the US and $579.99 in the UK, which if we're honest, is out of reach for the majority of consumers. But that's okay because the 5900X was basically exactly the same when that launched at the same price. But as time went on, that came down in value and is now a somewhat semi-affordable kind of processor for those who can harness the power of it. What is interesting is that the 7900X is now priced, at least in the US, the same as the 5950X. But I think it's safe to assume that the 5950X and the whole range of the 5000 series will start dropping in price, which does give them an opportunity to create a bigger gap when looking at the value for money aspect. But that goes with kind of anything new. The newer product will cost more money and will generally be more powerful. But that's not to say that it offers the best value for money. And that's true for CPUs, GPUs, and pretty much any major component of a PC. Now with the 7900X, we showed a lot of gaming tests, but also showcased its potential when it comes to workload. And I think it's safe to say that AMD have done a great job to increase performance over the generation before. And for the most part, we saw the 7900X either ahead of the 5950X or at similar levels. And I'm okay with that because we have a 7950X coming into our offices soon and that should offer up performance above and beyond that. I think one key thing to take away is that the 7900X in our productivity tests and in gaming fought tooth and nail with the Intel i9-12900K and comes in cheaper too. So what I'm trying to say is it does offer superior value for money compared to Intel. And that's great for now. I say now because we all know Intel's 13th generation range of processors are coming. So it's gonna be an interesting one to see how long AMD hold on to the title of having the superior product, because it may only be for a few weeks. I guess time will tell. Right now, I think with any new product and especially one that's classed as high end, like the 7900X is, there'll be two types of people. The ones who potentially need a product like this for work related tasks and whatnot, and those who just, I don't know, want the very best bleeding edge product and performance where, you know, money is no object. You have to remember, you're not just buying a new processor, but a new motherboard, new memory. And when you're spending that much, you're probably safe to say that you might as well just buy a whole new PC, especially with new GPUs on the horizon too. Whatever you choose to do, even though we've only looked at the 7900X today in this video, I think it's kind of, if it's performance is anything to go by, you'd expect the rest of the range to offer similar gains. So there really should be something for everyone, no matter what your needs are, or your wants, or your budget. But if you are looking at the high end, AMD really have something good with the Ryzen 9 7900X. And as I always say, it's nice to see kind of competition in the market, especially now that the playing field is, let's say, fairer than it's ever been with DDR5 and whatnot. It's a simple choice. If you're looking for value for money without going crazy, but also getting the balance of having the latest technology, I mean, if that sounds like you, then the 7900X is a clear winner in my books. And if previous generation Ryzen products are kind of anything to go by, then it's only going to get better over time. So yeah, what do you think? Let me know in the comments section below. Have AMD done enough or are Intel secretly lying in wait, ready to release the 13th gen and to simply kind of leapfrog AMD and claw back some more market share? I'm interested to see what you guys think. For now, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to all of our chart data, exclusive behind the scenes content, and much, much more. With that, see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.